All right, and next up, we have a Simona Cotin to talk about serverless. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me OK? Yeah? OK, cool. So we're having an awesome day, right? Good energy. Who here has been at the pub yesterday evening? That's very good. I haven't. <laughs> Uh, but I just want to thank you for having me because I, I, I think this is an awesome event and it's really nice to see such a like, well-connected community and that just show, shows how awesome Node.js is as well. So today I'm going to speak about uh, the serverless adventure and I hope that there's a few of you ha who have tried serverless and a few of you who are um, curious about serverless. My name is Simona Kotin, uh, as Brian mentioned, and I work as a developer advocate at Microsoft, and my role there is really to make the JavaScript community happy on Azure. How many of you are happy on Azure? <laughs> <laughs> There's lots of work there, right? <laughs> Uh, I also get to a geek out with people like John Papa and Sarah Dresner and Brian Clark and Asim Hussein, who are all my teammates and I love them, they're great, uh, on open source projects. So um, yeah, if you ever have feedback or questions about Node.js or uh, Angular or Azure or anything, do reach out on Twitter at Simona underscore Cotin or uh, just send me an email at simona.cotin at microsoft.com. Super simple, my name plus my surname. Okay, so serverless, right? Um, I'm starting with a story which has inspired me a lot. Um, it's about uh, a cloud guru. How many of you have heard about a cloud guru? There's a few hands. For those of you who don't know about a cloud guru, I just recommend you Google it right now. It's basically a startup that's teaching uh, the world about the cloud. And what's interesting about them, uh, as you can see here, it's two brothers from the countryside in Australia. And basically, um, the story started with Ryan, one of the, bro the brothers, uh, not passing an uh, Amazon interview. And after that happened, he just went back to uh, the classroom and started learning about cloud. And he realized that the training that was given to him was very similar to what he used to learn in university. And like, he didn't really like that. So he went back home and created these amazing uh, courses about cloud. And uh, six weeks later, he published them. And they got really popular, and they got a lot of traction. And he was like, you know what? I, maybe I can, maybe we have a business here. So then he reached out to his brother, and who at the time was working for Microsoft, and he told him about all this experience. And they decided to create a new training platform. And that's where A Cloud Guru is. And looking at the features, they basically had to uh, implement like, a system that will allow you to upload courses and also um, watch them. I, it would also allow you to um, like go through quizzes, right? Evaluate yourself. Um, also, uh, being able to buy courses or like, an online store and uh, sign up and log in. And uh, obviously, because we jump from zero users to one million users, uh, you need to be able to scale effortlessly. And the trick was that they only had four weeks for this. How does that sound? Does that sound scary, kind of? Yeah? Does that sound like you have to do things like, how many times have you managed to do that? Uh, I think it's a lot of work. And uh, basically, the first few days uh, Sam, that sp Sam spent on this, um, he only spent them on provisioning infrastructure and configuring servers and just spending a lot of time on that. And he realized that he's never going to finish this in four weeks' time if he's going to spend so much time on things that are actually not related at all to what he was actually meant to do. And how many times has it happened to you guys? Like, I do have a, a startup idea or I do want to start a new project and you're like, oh yeah, but... Um, what technology do I use? What kind of server do I use? Does it uh, support how many concurrent requests? And where do I deploy it? And then you're like, you know what? I'm just going to go grab a beer, right? <laughs> 
I, I, that has happened to me many times. Like I do have a list of things that I wanted to build and never ended up building. And a Cloud Guru, they actually managed to build everything in four weeks, all the features that we saw there, uh, by implementing everything using serverless. And they're now running at 300,000 customers with thousands of, cost of users watching concurrently videos or uploading uh, courses. And they're also available in 177 countries, which means they're a globally distributed platform. And they're very popular, which means that they did a good job. So then, what's the moral of the story here? Well, they managed to build this with only two people in four weeks' time, right? So that's, that's really, uh, it goes to show how um, fast you can go when you are using, when you don't care about infrastructure, you don't have to think about all the code that's not related to your, um, to your business logic. So then you get to focus on your actual business value. So what is serverless? Like this is definitely the buzzword of the century, right? Or decade, or it has started from 2012 and um, last year, it's even today, like this year, uh, people are still uh, kind of, they're not feeling very comfortable anymore asking what serverless is because um, like it's, it's been around for quite a bit. But if we were to look at a um, definition, like serverless architectures refer to applications that depend on backend services, but are, are also uh, able to run uh, custom code in uh, ephemeral containers. And that comes from uh, Martin Fowler. And what we're saying is that uh, you no longer need to, so it's not like there's no servers, but you don't have to think about them. You don't have to think about managing them. And uh, in this architecture, basically you're writing code that reacts to events. It auto scales without you having to do anything. Your cloud provider or your provider will take care of that. And you pay as you go. And my friend Burke here uh, had a very, very interesting analogy like imagine at home, um, you do have water, you have a tap, right? And imagine um, you leaving the tap on all the time. Would that happen? That would be stupid, right? You only use, you only turn on the uh, tap when you need it and then you turn it off. So why wouldn't we do the same with our infrastructure and with our code? Why do we have to have so much CPU um, waste? That's a good word, right? Okay, so there's a few serverless providers out there. Um, you've probably heard about Amazon Lambda. Azure has also an offering called Azure Functions. Uh, there's also an offering from cloud, cloud uh, Google Cloud Functions. Um, many of you who have been here before, uh, last year have heard the talk from Auth0 uh, about WebTask, where they basically build an, um, an extension to their, plat they build serverless, serverless platform as an extension to the Auth0 platform. And I thought that was a very interesting uh, use case where basically they allowed you to um, run functions um, for running custom code on your authentication events. And also uh, IBM OpenWhisk, and the Azure Functions and IBM OpenWhisk uh, offering, offerings, they're also open source. So if you ever want to um, see how things are implemented, you can just go on GitHub and see the code, or you can even host your own solution. So uh, I think that's great, right? We do love open source. But with this list of vendors, there's actually an interesting uh, question that you can see popping here and there. And that's like, yeah, but if I'm committing to a vendor, uh, does that mean that my code will be specific to that vendor? And the thing is that um, the functions, the code that you write for functions, they're, it's, it's pretty generic. It's, it's JavaScript, or um, if you're writing, um, I don't know, Java or anything else, that's gonna be quite generic. But actually, the, most the more interesting part is that when you're e implementing serverless architectures, you're not only writing custom code, but you're also depending on third-party services. And that 
what that really means is that you will end up um, with dependencies on things like DynamoDB or Cosmos DB or uh, the messaging queue or the storage um, offering that um, Amazon or Azure has. And if they don't make a good job at abstracting and making sure that you're writing generic code, then you're definitely uh, kind of locked in, but not because of the function code, but because of the services that you're using. So whenever you're choosing a vendor, make sure that you are, um, yeah, you are using, um, their, you, you are first evaluating them and make sure that they're right for you and then use their services wisely. There's also alternatives here, like you could use, uh, for your functions, you could use frameworks, multi-provider frameworks, like the serverless framework. How many of you have heard about of the serverless framework? Yeah, it, it allows you to, it makes deployment easy to uh, different providers. Like you can easily deploy your code to Amazon or Azure or any of those. So vendor lock-in, it's a problem, but it's not that big in terms of the code that you're writing. So how does this look in practice? Well, a hello world function, it's quite simple. It's a JavaScript function that receives the context object as a parameter, and the context object allows you to interact with your runtime. And you can do things like uh, logging messages, or you can set the response that you're gonna send. And you can also, you should call um, the method done on your context uh, object because that will basically um, they say that my function has finished running. Another type of uh, function that you can write is a timer type of function, and that's for normally a cron job, like the, the usual cron job. And you can do that, for example, a good example for that is um, in Ireland, you have to submit, I mean, it's good to submit your uh, meter reading, and I think that's valid for many countries as well. So uh, I used to create a calendar event, a recurrent one, that would remind me that I have to send my uh, meter reading on a monthly basis. Well, now you can just create a function that will send you an email or send you an SMS, and it's just, uh, it's, it's a few lines of code. So I'm gonna show you here. Wait. Okay. This is this is quite basic, so I don't think it's super interesting for um, um, for anyone. But uh, like, it looks like this is running right now, and. Um, it just uh, triggers every minute. It gets triggered every minute. minute. Um, but a more interesting use case is actually a webhook. And I guess that everyone here knows what a webhook is. Uh, just a second. Um, so you can use webhooks, for example, to uh, react to events that happen on um, GitHub. Like uh, when a new commit has happened, you can just trigger a new build and that will like, maybe um, trigger a new build on CircleCI, for example. But the demo that I have here actually is a webhook that um, um, basically integrates with Twilio. And whenever um, you receive a message, um, we're gonna analyze the sentiment of that message and then maybe send a message back, right? Because that would be an interesting uh, use case. And to analyze the sentiment of that message, we're using, um, I'm using cognitive services. And this is the code for it. So what I'm doing here is uh, using the Twilio package, um, I'm, this is my access key, which I'm gonna delete about after this, but <laughs> you, can, you can actually set it uh, in the environment variables. I was just being very lazy here. And uh, this is the URI for cognitive services that I'm, I'm calling. And um, I am um, basically, I'm parsing the uh, message that I'm receiving. And do we have any volunteers to send the message to this number? 
I hope this works. But like, does anyone feel brave enough to do that? Yeah? No? I can do that otherwise. Does that make me brave? I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, OK, so as we can see, there hasn't been a trace in 18 minutes. And probably, as you might know, functions have a kind of cold start. So um, I'm just going to say node conf is awesome. And we should see some um, logs here. But the idea is that uh, basically we're parsing the uh, text that we've received in our uh, SMS, and then we're calling this method get sentiments uh, with um, like a document that contains our um, our message. And then here we are just uh, issuing a request to the cognitive services uh, API. This is the URI that we've seen earlier. Uh, we're sending the access key, and then um, we are handling that response um, by just uh, the the API will send you uh, will give you a score where based on whether it's closer to one, that means that um, you are super happy in your message. Otherwise, uh, you are not that happy. So, um, yeah. And then we are sending a message back. And you can see that I, what I've said here is, so the function has executed. And I've said that node conf is awesome. Um, and then you can see that the score of this text is 0 0.999. So it's very close to super happiness. <laughs> and the function has completed. And yeah, this is great. So another use case for, uh, for serverless is creating your own web APIs. And because what we do with simple applications, basically uh, we just um, create a, service, a server that will um, retrieve data uh, from the database and then return it to a client. So we can easily do that with functions as well. And I have an example here uh, where I'm just creating uh, new heroes. I'm retrieving a list of heroes. And um, with most providers out there, you can also create, um, you'll have bindings. So you can directly bind your function to a certain database or to Twilio or to SunGrid. And in this case, I've created a binding to uh, Cosmos DB. So what this means is that uh, I'll basically go directly and query um, the Cosmos DB API. And you'll see how, how little code you have to write in this example, where basically I'm just writing two lines of code. I'm just retrieving from the context the list of bindings and uh, retrieving the heroes one. And you define your binding in a JSON file, but you can have a UI for this as well. So what we're saying is that we have a function that um, has an anonymous authentication model, and um, it, reach, it, it gets a HTTP request, and it returns an HTTP response. Um, it's called res. Uh, res. And then the binding is a document DB type of binding. It's called heroes. And this is my database admin. And um, I'm creating a connection there. And it's an input binding. And this is everything that I have to write to retrieve all the data from, from that collection. And we can see it working. Um, for example, I'm just um, maybe running a Postman request where I get, I'm, I'm calling the, the function, I'm calling a get using the URL of the function. And this is just gonna retrieve all the heroes that I already have in my, 
in my database, and Burke is my number one hero. Okay, and then this is, so this is just a get uh, request, but then um, you can also, like, again, create a request. We can still use the binding that we've seen earlier, and um, things are very simple as well. So I do have a um, new endpoint with just 20 lines of code. And that's very simple. It's just a few minutes, maybe an hour to build this. And obviously all the CRUD operations here. Okay, what do we have next? Uh, data processing. So yesterday we've seen uh, Nikki um, analyze um, from the client, from the browser, um, some of the things around her. And I thought that it would be interesting to do something to build a similar demo where you can see how you can use machine learning from a function. So um, in, again, in serverless, you can react to, for example, image uploads um, in a storage account. Um, or you can, again, build HTTP uh, requests. And here, I have a function that detects emotion in a picture. So this is very simple. Again, uh, we have a function that receives a con the context object and the request object as a parameter, and then I'm sending um, a request to this URL, cognitive services, blah, blah, blah. And then here I've used the uh, environment variable, so you cannot steal this one. And then I'm just sending the, the request with a URL to an image. And the image that I'm gonna use is, let's see. Does this look happy? <laughs> Let's see what cognitive services think. Okay, so this has just run. And I'm gonna expand the logs. And basically, it gives me things like, uh, where's my face, what's the height, the, um, the left and top points. And then it gives me again a score of anger. I'm not too angry. Contempt, some. Disgusts close to zero. <laughs> no fear, but happiness, mm, 50% maybe. And yeah, you do have some details there. We can also try with a different picture, which is um, clearly more happy. So I'm, I've just replaced the URL. And this is a panel where I can easily test functions right in the browser. And I do have the response here, and as you can see, it's one happiness. That is great, right? And you can also, uh, there's another API that tells you, gives you even tags, just like you've seen in Nikki's demo. Okay. So we've seen a few of the things that you can build with serverless, and I think all of them, they're very interesting and exciting use cases. Uh, but there's a few key things happening there. So with functions, you do have an execution time limit. And depending on uh, the provider, you can have up to like a limit of five minutes to 10 minutes. So once, if, you're, if you have long running tasks, or for example, if you want to move from an existing application to a serverless platform, or a serverless architecture, if you have uh, methods that are long running tasks, you'll have to re-architect that. Um, then there's also the thing that functions are stateless, so you cannot um, really um, share state between function runs. They're a bit like goldfish, right? <laughs> or they don't remember what happened five minutes ago. Um, but that's, there's a good part to this as well, right? Because you want your functions to be immutable, and if you really want to share state, then you have to uh, maybe use a storage for that, or you can use message queues, or, yeah. And then cold starts are also an important thing to consider. Because when your functions are being run, uh, you need to 
um, they run in a container, right? So if your, um, your application has a constant user flow, then probably you're gonna have those containers running uh, constantly. But if you have spikes, then to uh, deal with those spikes, spikes you need, we need to run a new container or a new virtual machine for you. And that means that we also need to install the dependencies that you have uh, in your function. So it takes a bit of time to do that. And it can take from 10 milliseconds to maybe 20 seconds or so. So that's something that you need to consider. Like if you have a low latency um, requirement for your application, then maybe serverless is not for you. But the thing is that like, serverless obviously simplifies deployment because you no longer need to focus on provisioning your servers. And it's good for, th for things like image processing, task management, workflows, and notifications, right? So we're at a Node.js conference. So why do we, th why, why do we care about Node.js in a serverless um, context? Well, because it's awesome for once, but then it's also because like, JavaScript has a really a rich ecosystem of existing libraries and tools and we can actually reuse those for, our, uh, for, for this new serverless thing. And there is also a bunch of front-end developers that already knows, uh, know JavaScript and they, they can now build um, scalable backends. And also like, uh, JavaScript is so widely used it's like the English of languages. And it's also lightweight, it helps reduce cold start, and it runs equally um, on most operating systems. And it's made for distributed systems. So that all sounds great, like unicorns and rainbows, everything's perfect, but is it? Like with every technology out there, there's obviously drawbacks. And uh, one of the talks that's really good and I recommend you watching is from Charity Majors at Serverless Conf, uh, where she talks about the fact that um, serverless is really cool, but then what you did here, you basically outsourced uh, all your control. Because now you, no you can no longer SSH into your uh, server maybe, or you, you cannot do whatever you wanted to do. You cannot install the versions that you wanted to use for your application. You are forced to update your application um, to different node versions, for example. So you've lost that. Also, the tooling is not as mature as um, in a traditional environment. And logging and monitoring, that's something you depend on your provider for. But again, I want to leave you thinking of this, like the thing that distinguishes the best, fastest, and most efficient engineering organizations is how little code they actually write. So this is very close to uh, zero code is perfect code, right? Thank you. Mm -hmm.